Hi, welcome to the Virtual News Show. Imagine spending 16 years dreaming and training for a dream job, and then you are told to quit by doctor's orders. How do you recover or at least cope with something like that and cope with a debilitating head trauma that keeps compounding over the years? My guest today is Dave Matthew Body, and he has endured 15, 15 concussions and bullying. He's, he's lost his dream career in wrestling. He was recently diagnosed with a terrifying uh, news about brain damage that he incurred from some of the concussions. And yet, this man does not give up. He is a beacon of hope and a light for youth. He is a champion of anti-bullying campaigns. He tells his story so freely that he can help others. So welcome, Dave. I'm interjecting into the video here because this is the part of the video that did not get recorded on the Facebook Live due to my <laughs> first time user on the BeLive platform. So it is my bad. But anyway, um, Dave had described some of what he goes through on a daily basis with his concussion system symptoms. And also it's more than concussions. It's his entire body. He's in constant pain met much of the time and and depression anxiety and brain damage are all part of the the package i will add a link to another interview that i saw of him that wasn't that long ago that where he does describe all of this in detail and i had also asked him to explain just talk about his wrestling career and the you know his training to become a professional wrestler and he also talked about some of the people he used to hang with and, you know, where where some of his injuries came from. He had many of them during his wrestling career. and One of them, he was attacked, was hit by a shovel. And so that's another place his concussions come from. So it's quite a remarkable story. But uh, in any, it was only like, 15 minutes of it that went missing before I realized I didn't have him on the screen. I will continue on with the rest of the interview and it is quite good. So to explain to people, it's a lot simpler because I, I share my story like an open book. I'm constantly putting out content about my daily struggles and what I'm dealing with and it's helping people. So I started a thing that, uh, sorry, not a thing, but a movement called the feel real journey, which is where, you cannot heal until you feel real. And what happens is the, the hardest part about struggling is you feel like you have, to, you have to suppress things. Like you have to be like, okay, I can't speak about my, my struggles. I can't speak about my weaknesses or uh, where I'm having the most difficulty because people judge you. They call you weak. They say man up. They say toughen up. So you, you conceal everything. And my favorite thing to say is the more you suppress, the bigger the mess. Mm -hmm. So you have to like express your feelings and, like, I'm not ashamed to cry in front of anybody. I'll cry right now if I wanted to. I, I don't care because I'm on a journey of just feeling real where I feel everything and I allow myself to grieve through it. Because if you start ignoring emotions, that's where things can get really tricky. And when it comes to concussions and brain injury and the fact that everyone deals with it differently with different symptoms, you have to remember, okay, in order to recover, I have to actually be real with everything. I have to actually feel the way I feel and can't hide it. So another reason why I don't have to explain it too much to people is I'm constantly speaking of it. Mm -hmm. And it's not to, to, you know, accept it and say, oh, it is what it is. It's just being my, my recent diagnosis and the ev evaluations I'm going through, it changed my mindset completely. So how do you keep yourself going, Dave? Because I, I know your, fat, your wife is your rock. Um, yep. But how it can so easily get you down. I mean, all the stuff that you've gone through, it can so easily rob you of your psyche. And, and you could, if you're in constant pain, it has to drain you all the time. So how do you get up every morning and just say, screw it, I'm just going to go motivate somebody? <laughs> you, you actually answered the question on point within the question. Uh, <laughs> my one of my favorite quotes that I, I always speak about is one of the best ways to heal 
is to help other people heal with you. Um, so when I'm having what I call a test day, the most common phrase is I'm having a bad day or today's a tough day. I always say it's a test day because internal vocabulary, it, it matters, the way you speak to yourself and the words you use. In the past, I'd say bad day, and I realized that psychologically I was sabotaging and hindering my my recovery because I'm like, oh, it's a bad day. It's it's already done. So now I'm like, okay, you know what? Like today, actually, I posted that today was a, was a test day. Mm-hmm. I just I woke up with no motivation whatsoever. I had no ambition. I I had no energy, and that's probably because the last few days I exerted a lot of mental energy just doing content and reading and interviews and whatnot. And so I expected it. And the way that I deal with these is I focus on strategies that I've learned in brain injury rehab, like resting, like actually resting. People think Mm -hmm. sitting down watching TV is resting, but that's not resting because your mind's still Mm -hmm. active. It's still focusing on, it's still in motion. So resting for me is meditation. I absolutely love meditation. I always speak highly of it. It's been around for 2,500 plus years. It gets working. It helps me a lot. I focus on mental grounding. I focus on reading, I focus on exercise, but most importantly, I focus on water. Like I have a strict routine where I wake up in the morning, I drink three glasses of cold cold water to wake my organs up, wakes me up, I do a stretch, I do a a quick eight fit workout, which is an amazing app, by the way. Um, I keep myself going just with the understanding that I know my life has value. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm struggling, the struggle doesn't mean I lose value and worth. So I wake up every morning saying, you know what? I have a lot of friends who have lost. I've lost over nine friends and I know that they wish they could be here where I am right now, even though I'm struggling, I I know they wish they can still be here. So I'm like, you know what? I got to show honor to my friends and pursue the happiness that I know that they would support me on. A a lot of things drive me. Uh, My family, of course, you know, having the responsibility of raising two kids, being, you know, being engaged and planning a, a, a marriage or a wedding. Like I just, I have so many things to keep me focused but that doesn't make it easy no because like i said some days it's just you 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 lose it and i'm like okay i have to understand that there's only two things i can control in this world right now and that's my effort and my focus like i have to understand that that's all on me so when i woke up this morning i said okay this is how i'm feeling this is how i can overcome it and you have to put more emphasis on the solution than the problem because when you start just focusing on the problem, it drains you. I call it the stub toe, you know, the stub toe. You wake up in the morning and you stub your toe. You have two choices. You can let that stub toe just ruin your whole day or say, you know what, I'm going to deal with this. I'm just going to move past it. So the way I, I do it is I, I live in the moment. So this morning I woke up very, I'll be honest with you, I'm very depressed. I, I felt very sad. I just did not know why. I know why, but I don't know why, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to feel this. I'm going to grieve through it. And I'm just going to carry on and it may come out, it may happen again today, but I'll be prepared for it. And so it's, it's just a lots of preparation and lots of research and understanding and listening to the right voices. Like I used to have family that say, Oh, you're fine. You'll get over mm-hmm. it. But I knew the truth. And I'm like, no, I, okay. So I, all I can do is focus on what's real. And when I told my family, my recent diagnosis, which was on November 12th, I saw a neurologist and she said that my symptoms will most likely never heal, but they'll worsen as I age. Um, So now I'm being evaluated for what's called permanent PCS, which is permanent post-concussion syndrome. I'm also being evaluated for uh, dysthemia, which is a progressive permanent depression. So it's two very serious diagnoses. And my neurologist also spoke to me about CTE. She also spoke to me about dementia. She's basically, I just told him, like, I need you to lay out everything that's possible. And just let me just grieve and understand what the severity of it is. Um, CTE is definitely one of my biggest fears mm-hmm. because it's it's being more commonplace. It's being more understood. I'm not saying I have it, mm-hmm. but the, the, the neurologist said that the early stages of CTE usually show between the ages of 30 and 40. Mm-hmm. I'm 34 next month. So she said, you're showing all the signs. You haven't healed since 2006. My last concussion was 2011, and I'm still dealing with all those symptoms. So it's like when I got told the truth, it wasn't the truth I wanted, mm-hmm. but now I know it. I can be like, okay, I'm going to alter my diet, which is a lot of brain power food, which is like grapes, uh, kiwi, bananas, just natural organic stuff, uh, lots of water, lots of rest. 
the hardest part right now that I'm struggling with is the financial part because because I'm not diagnosed officially yet and I'm off work due to injury, the government is no longer um, financially supporting me. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like now I'm in the situation of, okay, I got to get these tests done. I got to get diagnosed. That way I can figure out the financial part. And I told my my doctor the reason why my concussion is never healed is because I was always under financial pressure. Yeah. Because, and that's common. Like people can't heal nowadays because they're like, oh, you can go on, on EI, but you only get paid like 65% of your wage. So you have to understand you just lost hundreds of dollars and your bills don't care. So that's the hardest part, I think, for recovery as an adult is how do you manage the, the finances as well as the recovery? And then sometimes you realize I can't do this. Yeah. When I was in rehab, in 2011, I was supposed to be there for nine to 12 months, but I left within five months because of financial pressure. Mm -hmm. And I think that decision led to where I am today because I didn't give myself time to heal. Uh, when I left the rehab, they tried to convince me to stay, but because they legally couldn't force me, I said, no, I got to go get back to work. I went back to work and haven't been the same since. You know, I've been fired numerous times. I've quit jobs, walked off jobs, just mentally... I wasn't there. I wasn't in the right mental space to actually hold the job. And that's why over 50% of Canadians who are homeless have suffered brain damage or brain trauma in the past because it changes you. Like you yeah. just, you don't know who you're, who you're going to become. You don't know how long it's going to last for it. You know, people now are, they've now found that one concussion could be life altering, but where before it's like, Oh no, you have two or three concussions, You'll still be fine. But now they're saying no one concussion can truly start the domino effect. Yeah, I still feel some, I just had the one, I can't imagine 15, but I still have some residual effects. They're not quite as severe as they used to be, but it does stay with oh, you for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, I know, I look fine. <laughs> you look fine. Was my, first, my first ever concussion, I was four years old, four, and I hit my head so hard on the side of a hideaway bed. That's how old I am. We used to have hideaway beds. <laughs> I hit my head so hard on that that I popped blood vessels in the right side of my brain. Well, those those and, things were hard as rock. <laughs> oh, I, I popped them, and my right side of the head, like a little spot, was like a sponge. You could push in my my head, and you can feel it, the yeah. blood moving. Yeah. And that was my first concussion. Then I had numerous concussions from bullying, and I had more concussions from football. And <laughs> the, the the number one truth to me is I have fifteen documented uh, concussions. But I you there probably a have chance. more than that, yeah. I have more, yeah. But I can't document it or prove it. No. So that's a scary part of concussion. Well, that should put you on disability involved. as as it is. But oh you well. would think that's another. Let, let's <laughs> let's talk about youth bullying too, because it is you know obviously it is something that you're very passionate about uh, talking to youth about. Adults get bullied. I mean, there's I I've talked about uh, adult cyberbullying, and uh, I've have my own cyber bully that's trying to mess up my footprint and all that stuff. And, and I've heard so many horror stories and I wrote a book about uh, business cyber bullying and that can debilitate somebody's uh, businesses. But, mm -hmm. you know, youth, I mean, it starts somewhere, it starts in youth. And, um, you know, I think a lot of us have experienced it in, in school, but, but today um, do you see it as just, do you see it as kind of an epidemic and how are adults contributing to this? Because you see adults behaving stupidly on social media and you think, you wonder if those kids that are being bullies looking at what their parents are doing and thinking, Oh, well, that's okay to do it to somebody else. And I, and I use that uh, Swedish girl, Greta Thunberg, as an example. I mean, you see memes going around. Adults are pushing those memes and, and de denigrating mm -hmm. a 16-year-old girl. And, you know, we see it bigger than that. But uh, so do you see youth bullying as kind of an epidemic or is it just adulting is not what it used to be? <laughs> um, first and foremost, the adults are unfortunately not leading by the example they mm. want. Um, and that's one thing that um, I am a former life coach of seven years. I, I actually walked away from life coaching about two months ago due to my uh, recent troubles. However, when I was doing life coaching, it was 
astronomical how many families I was supporting and just witnessing the behaviors of the adults and then connecting them to the behavior of the youth and realizing, okay, that's the correlation. Because numerous situations arise with bullying. Uh, first of all, I feel the word bullying is thrown around mm. a lot more than it needs to be because bullying is consistent. It's a consistent behavioral thing. So if your son or your daughter comes home saying that a person called them a name, that's not bullying because that's a one-time situation. It's just name calling. It's not fun nonetheless, but it's not bullying. And I feel that that's one of the biggest issues is, is that terms thrown around all mm -hmm. the time. Even mm -hmm. for example, on Twitter today, I saw someone gave constructive criticism to a fellow adult and the response was don't bully me. And I'm like, that's that, w that, that wasn't bullying. Like now you guys are just using that word to grant, you know, to, to garner attention. However, it is real. Um, depression, anxiety, uh, unfortunately, youth suicide has drastically increased. Mm -hmm. I lost my best friend in 2004 due to suicide. Um, he was um, part of the LGBT community. His, his family disowned him. When that happened, he unfortunately lost his life. I've lost three other people due to suicide or close to me. It's, it's, it's very common, unfortunately. However, our current society, I believe, is a huge result of that. We have kids like just just last week. I, I had a, a youth that's very close to my family. She was assaulted in her school while three girls recorded it on their cell phones, and then they shared it to social media. That's where youth mindset is right now. It's virally, virality. Sorry, they want to go viral. So social media is definitely not helping with the situation. It definitely is an epidemic. Um, the the amount of of use that we're losing on a daily basis over 160,000 youths every single day refuse to go to school due to safety concerns. Um, every seven minutes, there's a a bullying situation on the playground in Canada. Like it's very common. Mm -hmm. It's it's always been an issue. Like when I was going through my bullying situations, it was never labeled as bullying. It was just teasing. It was just phases. But then they realized it was getting serious. Like for example, in grade six, which was 1996. I was thrown down a flight of stairs, and then I had two males hold me while a third threw rocks and razor blades at my face. I was spat on. I was kicked. Um, I dealt a lot with bullying. I actually suffered three concussions from bullying situations. One was a kid pulled a chair beneath me. I smacked back my head on a concrete wall, was dizzy immediately, started puking. The second one, I was climbing like this wooden structure that led to a slide. He kicked me off the slide – or sorry, off the wooden structure. I hit my head in the back of a – on the back of a wooden frame of the playground. And then the third was dodgeball. I was, I peeked over and a kid waited and he threw the, the, the dodgeball right at my head, which knocked me out. So like bullying is, it's to the point where I tell people that it's, it's happening. However, what's happening is it's not being dealt with accordingly. Mm -hmm. Um, you see it everywhere. Schools saying we are against bullying. We have a stand. Uh, I'm sorry, a strict policy on bullying. And I removed my son from school in August. Sorry, beginning of September this year due to bullying, yeah. due to mental health and anxiety issues. And I'm like, you got to take that sign off the door because it's not true. It's false. You guys have a strong stance. However, it's never enforced. There's no investigations launched. I also found that some schools will actually hide reports of bullying. Mm -hmm as an attempt to not lose funding. Um, it was actually shared nationally here in Canada that some provinces don't legally have to do reports for violent acts of between youth and another youth. That was very alarming, knowing that they don't have to have a report for it. I also found out that when students request ice packs, there's usually a report that goes along with it, and that's why sometimes kids don't get ice packs. They get, oh, it's fine, you're fine, because they don't want to do a report. Wow. So I feel the reason why bullying is increasing drastically on a yearly basis is because adults are not stepping foot forward and saying, okay, we're here for you. We want to help you. So individuals like myself and many other individuals that have, you know, campaigns and organizations for bullying, we're stepping in saying, okay, we're going to help you because many other people are turning their backs on you. And then in, to further what you said about how you see adults reacting, it's it's so true because you see adults fighting over parking stalls. You see adults far, uh, fighting over groceries in a lineup. Uh, should we speak about Black Friday? Like, there's so many examples of adults that are misbehaving. Well, even like, politics. Well, like, how 
awful oh, are they acting in politics? <laughs> we won't get into politics, but how <laughs> awful is, I mean, that is like the quintessential poster for bullying. I mean. It's terrible. <laughs> like it's, and when I was studying psychology in college before I dropped out, because I realized I was wasting a lot of money, first of all, because all the stuff I was being taught is accessible on, on the internet. <laughs> it's accessible through books on Amazon. So I'm like, I'm going to save my money. I'm going to pursue this so I can put my money elsewhere. And I started researching in psychology before I dropped out that uh, behaviors within, within, within adults is, is driven by society based on region of the world. So for example, in North America, we're very individualistic. Mm -hmm. If you watch our marketing, you'll realize it's all you how to benefit you, how to make you better, how to make you better than the competition. And I'm like, holy cow, collaboration is key. Like competition is healthy for sports. Yeah. But when it comes to business, when it comes to you know humanity, collaboration is the key. And that's why I said when I started building my uh, anti-bullying and my youth empowerment business, Bodyguards and Entertainment, was because I realized that in 2012, cyberbullying was on a huge increase. But it wasn't just with kids. Like you mentioned uh, Gre uh, Greta. Like when I see adults calling her names and saying, oh, it's, she's just a mentally ill child and so and all the stuff they're saying, I'm like, but I promise you, if you got a phone call from your child's school mentioning what your children are doing, you'd probably be mad at your son or your daughter. But here you are yeah. on social media just doing the exact opposite. So you got to <laughs> lead by example. Yeah. Whatever, whatever um, – strict rules you put in place for your children you better be the leading example of it yeah. um and like i said my son went through it for for numerous years of bullying my my daughter had some situations but not much so it's different for each child you know each child some children are able to overcome it and one of the biggest issues i found when i was doing life coaching was parents telling their children just ignore it mm. no you can't ignore it children their minds and their brains are programmed differently than adults ours the, the human brain is developing until you're 26 years old. So if you're having your child who's six years old and their brain's still developing, they're not going to be able to say, "Oh, I can, I can just annoy, you know, ignore the name calling." That's not how it works for children. They, for them, it's fight or flight immediately. Yeah. So if you can imagine a, a youth going to school and having that mindset of, or some not the mindset, but being in a state of fight or flight all day, you can imagine how stressed they are. And that's why sometimes when kids get home, they're just like mentally fatigued because they have so much stress all day that they're hiding. And I always tell parents, as soon as your children get home, please give them the time and be very specific with the questions you ask. Like ask some questions like what made you smile today? Mm -hmm. What made you sad today? Focus on emotions. What made you happy? What made you sad? What did you see? Don't ask them questions like, well, you know, what'd you do today? Kids are not going to remember. No. Like they have so much stuff in their mind when they get home. This one, you know, release. <laughs> So I always tell parents, when your kids get home from school, ask them the right questions of what made you happy today? What made you smile? What made you sad? What made, you know, start with those questions and then slowly go into like, what was your favorite subject today? What was your favorite lesson? Make sure that, that you make the, the, the child know that you are more concerned with their emotions than their academics. Hey, Dave, I think that's and, your next book. Talking yes. about those questions. <laughs> <laughs> to ask how to what to ask your kids when it's, they come home. It's extremely important because children are not only dealing with bullying, they're dealing with academic pressure. Yeah. Get your A's. Or sorry, I guess it's not really letters now. It's like numbers. It's like get <laughs> your one, two, three. Like yeah, number uh, one is very bad. Uh <laughs> so three is good and four is excellent. So now yeah. it's like get your threes, get your fours, and that's all parents care about. And I get it, because we're all stressed. We're all focused. We're all yeah. overwhelmed with work and business. But I'm like, at the end of the day, though, the mental health in regards to academic pressure is so high now that in China, they actually have a school, actually numerous schools have security officers on top of the roof because they found that children or even high school students were going to the top roof and jumping when they failed wow. tests. And it's like, um, I held, or sorry, I, I coached a youth isn't that pressure from the parents, though, when you, you know? It's a mixture of both the yeah. school and the parents. Like, uh, for example, I told one parent who got really mad at me, but I said, you need to stop trying to impress Jack and Joan and just take care of your child. Because I'm like, while you're sitting there trying to tell your friends, oh, my son's going to college or my son's doing this, my daughter's doing that. But maybe your son daughter don't want to do that. So it's like a lot of parents, and it's not their fault because that's how we've been conditioned. We've been conditioned to go to school graduate, go to college, graduate, and then give your life away for 40 years. And that's what we're 
we're taught and with my children, it's all passion driven. Like, what do you love to do? Let's do that. Cause I'm like, I want to help change the mentality of listen, your school's marks, they do matter. However, your mental health is more important to me because that's your lifelong. Like I, I read a research and um, article a couple of days ago saying that multitasking is damaging regions of the brain that affect your, your empathy, your compassion, and your memory. Mm. So we have so many adults that are lacking empathy and, and focus because they're trying to multitask because that's what we're living in. And I'm like, well, that's what kids are dealing with too. Like they're trying to deal with puberty. They're trying to deal with dating and relationships and academic pressure and bullying. Like there's, it's definitely an epidemic. You know, you, you're not coaching anymore, but what are some of the things that you are doing right now? I, I think you mentioned before that you were doing a, you still kind of got your hands in wrestling in a way uh, with Most the definitely. podcast. And so what are some of the projects that you're working on now? So everything that I'm doing now, I'm doing because they're not as mentally ex- exerting. And that way I can preserve my mental health for as much as I can. But everything I do is aligned with my passion. It's it's just my my way of life where if I'm not aligned with my passion, I want nothing to do with it. But that's because I'm just sick of the toxicity. So right now I'm working on what's called Squared Circle Rewind Podcast, which is a wrestling podcast that we're reviewing every single WWE, WCW, and ECW pay-per-view in chronological order. Um, so my best friend Jesse, he's the memory genius. So he basically tells us, okay, this pay-per-view is next. Watch it, review it. And we just do it in order. We started with, with Starcade 1983. And our next episode, which is, 100, which is episode 112, is WWF King of the Ring 1996, where Steve Austin has apparently a big promo of where he uh, – brings out Austin 316. So on that podcast, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, there is parental advisory on it because my <laughs> friends do like to swear because it's wrestling. I mean, you know, when, when you're an adult and you're passionate, swearing brings out a whole, like you dropped the S-bomb like 12 times when we first started talking to yeah, them right? before this podcast. And I, I love it. The F-bomb um, or the S-bomb? <laughs> S-bomb. The Sierra bomb. The um, F-bomb comes when I watch it. football. <laughs> yeah. So if you're a hardcore wrestling fanatic and you love the old school wrestling, Definitely check us out. We're on Spotify. That's, you know, Square Excellent. Circle Rewind Podcast, which is produced by Call in the Ring Medium, which is our big overall brand where, where I do interviews with wrestlers. But the interviews I do with wrestlers is mainly focusing on mental health because mm. I understand there's so much shoot interviews. There's so much drama interviews like he said, she said, you know, all that stuff. I'm like, no, no, I want the person, person to tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Like what they struggle with. And that's inspiration from Lillian Garcia. She has a podcast called Chasing Glory. And it's such an amazing podcast because they talk about mental health, like anxiety, depression, suicide. And it's just, I want wrestling fans to learn to separate the character from the person. And I think that's very important. Uh, with those two projects, I'm very busy with. However, I'm also doing, like I said, my Feel Real Journey, which is a community I'm trying to build of people who are struggling with mental health or brain damage and brain injury. And so that's my main focus. That's my main goal. Um, Bodyguards United Entertainment. Okay, so that has been built since 2012. However, due to my recent health issues, I've had to pull back a lot of the projects within that. So now Bodyguards United Entertainment is going to be driven just towards social media, where I just feature kids from around the world that are doing amazing things. Because I've learned through my several years of coaching that youths are more inspired and influenced by fellow youths mm. than they are adults. Mm. Cause whenever, whenever an adult says you should do this, they just like, Oh, it's an authority thing. <laughs> but when they see a 16 year old kid who's winning awards and traveling the world, they're like, Oh wow, I can do that. So bodyguards is all about youth empowerment, youth inspiration. A lot of my life has changed since November because yeah. I'm like, okay, I got a, before I was doing life coaching, I was doing 40 hours a week doing that. And that was very mentally exhausting because I was dealing with kids who had their neck broken, kids who were in hospital, in and out with suicide, like very serious situations. And I'm glad I was part of their journey and I helped them. But I told all of them, I'm like, listen, I have to focus on me now because I can't pour from an empty cup no more. Mm -hmm. Give, because you are so um, savvy with digital media and you're you're everywhere. Because you've been a life coach, are you writing new rules for coaching? Because you're really using these this medium to coach 
in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, I find that coaching, unfortunately, has a lot of negative attention with it, mm. saying, you know, you're controlling people or you're demanding them. I'm like, no. The, the, the best way that I explained coaching was I tie your shoes when they come untied, but you do the walking. Mm. That's, that's all it was for me was I'm just here to guide you. Like uh, coaching is all about questioning. It's all about knowing what questions to ask and helping the individual find the answer themselves. It's guidance. So I never liked the word coaching. So I was like, how can I change that? Because coaching sounds like you're yelling at them or you're motivating them and you're doing everything for them. Like, you you know, you're showing them the play and say, do it, do it, do it. I'm like, no, no, you're actually guiding them. Like, you're just saying, okay, I'm here to listen to you. And then with your responses, I will formulate a question that will help you think. And I always tell people, I'm like, I don't teach people how to, you know, what to think. I teach them how to think. Like, you know, as individuals, one of my greatest success stories of life coaching was a girl um, who was in a very abusive relationship and she literally messaged me as she was having an episode of anxiety and I helped her get her stuff packed and get out of the house. Wow. And I was like, and she's like, Dave, you saved my life. I'm like, no, I did not. I'm like, I just helped you get to the answers that you needed to find Mm -hmm. because when you're, when you're having an anxiety episode, you're not thinking clearly. You're, you're basically trying to throw a nickel in the air in the fog and trying to catch it. Like you just, it's so difficult to, to think clearly. And that's what my job as a coach was, was just to help guide you through to the result that you wanted when you told me, all right, Dave, this is what I want to do. How do I get it? I'm like, so one thing I did was I changed a lot of my vocabulary that are, is very common amongst coaching, like goal setting. I don't like the term goal mm. because goals can be very confusing to people. Because when someone says, I want to be 125 pounds, I'm like, that's not a goal. That's a result. Yeah. You know, that's a result. And now, so I use the words journey and uh, destination where I'll tell you, so your goal is your destination and your journey is how you get there. And everyone's like, oh, that's so interesting. I'm like, yeah, because when I started coaching, kids were like, oh, I want to be a gamer. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then they, they would just get so overwhelmed because they don't know how to get there. They're like, yeah. I don't know how to get there. I'm like, well, that's the problem. You you're confusing goal with destination. And as a result of that, you're mentally just becoming overwhelmed. So a lot of things that I was doing was, I don't want to say transcending, but it was different because I started realizing like, wait a minute, internal vocabulary is huge with how you think. And um, I did, I, I read Tony Robbins book, Awake the Giant Within, which is a 600 page book. So it's definitely a commitment to read it, but it's so informative and it teaches you how to work the brain and how to, you know, how to make memory stronger and habitual routines. And to answer your question earlier, another way that I get through is I have strict routines Mm -hmm. that I have to follow. And so I just created that as well. But after I left coaching, the one thing that I was getting most of was people were saying, thank you for being different. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a person where I like to see what's trending, but then jump on it, but then make my own little imprint on it. And that was one of the biggest changes I made was changing the word from goals to journey and just simple changes like that to help people click. Because when I first started coaching, I'm not going to lie to you, I was terrible within the first like (laughs) six months. I had no idea what I was doing. I was resorting back to my football days where I was coaching football. And I was like, this is not working. I'm like, so I had to do a lot more research. Um, So my best advice for people who want to be coaches and who are currently coaches is Never forget what you're there to do. And that's just the tie of shoes. Let them walk. They do the journey, but you're just there to say, oh, your shoelace is untied. Here you go. Keep going. That's, that's all it is. It's just have fun with it. Don't be all like, I'm here to save the day. I'm here to rescue you. Because one of the biggest things that I know some coaches were doing were they were helping people get away from therapy, mm-hmm. away from psychiatry, away from psychology. I'm like, no, no. You, you, if that's part of their journey, they have to see the psychologist. You help them set that up if they had to see a therapist you help them set up coaches are not replacement for psychiatrists and psychologists we're just there to help you find where you have to go before we wrap up the the broadcast i want to ask you a final question just oh geez <laughs> just based, you, you, i know you I'm hyped a... this up i'm nervous <laughs> just based on you know based on the stuff that we've talked about already in the interview um if you could give the audience some advice on how to move their needle forward to how to help themselves just through the, through the next week, what would that be? One of my favorite quotes that 
helped that I created when I was just discharged from rehab was as long as you are alive, you can adapt and affect change. Now, I, I think it's very important that when you realize that you're saying I'm going through something, people always say that in such a negative way, like, oh, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. You don't understand the positivity that's within that message. You're going through it. That means you're actively working on trying to get through it. So just keep going. Um, every morning you wake okay, – this, this is really dark, but it's so true, and I love saying it because kids – react to it differently than adults but every morning you wake up is a day closer to when you won't so you have to have urgency with your life you have to wake up every morning and say okay today's another day i'm going to do this and i know it can be hard um internal sorry external inspiration is useless without internal motivation you have to find that motivation internally external inspiration is beautiful i love being inspiration to a lot of kids and families but i was telling them if you don't have that internal motivation it's useless and the way you do that is you find your why, that one thing that just makes you happy, that goosebump feeling, and you just focus on that. Because the way that motivation works is you start with your why, and then you focus on it, which creates your vision, and that vision is what is where you find your natural motivation. So just keep focusing on what you love and what you want to do, and I promise you, you're going to get there. And it's not going to be an easy journey, but you will definitely get there because you will wake up every morning a winner, and you'll realize, okay – my prize for today is I have another life to live. I have another day to pursue it. Just understand that your struggle does not diminish your worth, period. Like you, your, your life has value every single day. And you're living proof. Thank I you. hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave. I appreciate <laughs> not you. Not a problem. I appreciate your time for this broadcast. It was awesome.